I want to read to you Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Listen to this again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. Conquer means to be victorious. Do you know the Greek word for victory is Nike? N-I-K-E? That Nike? That's how they would say it. But we hear in the U.S. we say Nike, right? That, that brand means to be victorious or to conquer to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. Manna means, what is it? Remember that food that they got, that the Israelites got in the desert? Manna, what is it? What is it? Interesting that Jesus says, you know, um, you guys, you ate manna in the wilderness, in the desert, but I am the bread of life. He's the true bread of life, right? So when it says, I will give some of the hidden manna, I'm wondering if this is, has to do with Christ or maybe you know how the bread stands for um, his body that was broken for us maybe that hidden manna is what our glorified new bodies will be like you know I'll give some of the hidden manna I'm not real sure about that there's a couple different ways you could see that right a lot of most people would probably say this it represents Jesus you know Jesus Christ because he's our true bread of life they ate manna in the wilderness but I give you something else I give you myself Jesus says but maybe this hidden manna has something to do with our new bodies that we receive glorified immortal new bodies and then it says and I will give him a white stone now if you stop you think of white why white well white you know we wear white robes we're clothed in white robes we're cleansed whiter than snow we're made the righteousness of god in christ you know we're clean because of the blood of the lamb so you get a white stone now this word for stone is sephos in greek p-s-e-p-h-o-s -E sephos it means a pebble or a small smooth stone david when when he when he reached into the brook he pulled out five smooth stones right you're unspotted you're unblemished in christ you're smooth so you get a white pebble or smooth stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Pretty interesting stuff to ponder and meditate on. By the way, here's some stuff. I, I, I researched this thing about white stones. And here's what I found out. In ancient times, people of 10, so 10 people would gather together and they would vote by casting stones. A white stone typically meant yes, and a black stone meant no. Interesting, right? A white stone means yes. Black stone means no. What's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 say about Christ? 2 Corinthians 1, 20. We'll just go over there real quick. It says, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why... It is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. So all the promises of God, they find their yes in him. In who? In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Yes and amen. Everything in Christ is yes and amen, right? So here we go. So white stone as they you know they would cast stones kind of like how people roll dice the white one yes the black one no so god receives you he accepts you he says yes you know when you when a bride says i do to the bridegroom she's saying yes 
I will marry you. Yes, I will be your wife. You see that? And when Christ looks at you, he says yes. Now, it's interesting about this white stone with a new name on it that nobody will know but you. I was thinking about names when I read that. I was thinking about names in scripture. Like Abram, God called him Abraham. Was it Abram that was written in the book of life or was it Abraham? How about Sarai? God breathed in grace to both of their names. He breathed hey into the name Abram, which became Abraham. He breathed his grace into the name. And he did the same thing with Sarai when she became Sarah. Was it Sarai? who's written in the book of life or Sarah. Just something to think about, right? And then I started thinking about, well, how about Saul of Tarsus? Was it Saul who is written in the book of life? Or was it actually Paul, the apostle, who is written in the book of life? A new name. Now, I know you're, you could be thinking, well, hey, listen, dude, um, that, that verse you just read says... Um, uh, it's a name that nobody would know. And yeah, I agree. But I'm just thinking about names and new names. God gave new names. A name isn't just a pronunciation. You know, my name, Michael. Okay, it's Michael. But there's a meaning behind my name, right? Who is like God. Saul means to ask or inquire of God. But Paul means a small or little one. Right? Somebody that doesn't exalt themselves as great, but they humble themselves and consider themselves a smaller one. And those that humble themselves will be exalted by the Lord. Was it Simon, whose name means to hear or hearing? Was it him that was written in the book of life, or was it actually Peter? the rock that was written in the book of life. On and on it goes, right? But I'm thinking about these differences. Saul was the one that was out to kill people that were followers of the way. What's the way? Well, Jesus says, I am the way. So they are followers of Christ. And Saul, who says that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he was out to kill them. He was on a murderous rampage. But then, when he actually meets the real Christ and gets blinded by his light, because if Saul was living in the light, he wouldn't have been blinded by the light. But since he was living in darkness and the light shined on him, it blinded him. Do you understand that? And the thing that res restored Saul's eyes was Ananias, a man named Ananias. God said to Ananias that he was going to restore Saul's sight. And the amazing thing is Ananias means the grace of God. So it was the grace of God that restored Saul's sight. Why do you think Saul, who becomes Paul is the apostle. We call him the apostle of grace because he preaches the grace of God. It is not by works that you are saved. It is by faith, right? By grace. It is by grace through faith you are saved. So you, God's grace saves you and your faith grabs hold of that saving grace. You understand? It, it, it grabs hold of that salvation. That's a gift to you. That's why it's called grace. So grace restores his sight. And then he becomes a believer, of course, in Jesus. And then what he does is he has, he has an identity change. It's not just a name, but it's an identity. Do you understand that? Do you know, that's what name really, in the name of Jesus, means in the identity of Jesus, in the authority of Jesus. It's not just the pronunciation, right? 
pronunciation of a name. I mean, I came from Jehovah's Witnesses who argue over the pronunciation they think because they, they think they pronounce God's name right. They got something going on with God that's really good because we say Jehovah, right? Instead of Lord or instead of Yahweh. Well, they argue over pronunciation. But this one, this divine God whose name has four letters in Hebrew, Y-H-W-H or yod Hey vav Hey. Instead of the pronunciation, it's the meaning behind the name. yod Hey vav Hey Hey means the hand of grace that was nailed in grace. Yod, the letter Y, is a picture of a hand. H, which is Hey in in Hebrew. It's a picture of an open window where God breathes out his grace. His grace is always flowing. That's why it's the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and five is the number of grace in Hebrew. So you got yod Hey, hand of grace, and then you got Vav, which is in English W or even V, right? Vav. And Vav is a picture of a nail or a spike. And don't think of little carpenter nails that we have today, we're talking about those big spikes that they hammered through people's wrists or hands when they hung them up on wood. So the hand of grace nailed, and what's the last letter? H, Y-H-W-H, yod Hey vav Hey. the hand of grace nailed in grace. Pretty powerful, right? And there's other ways to see the divine name of God too, that's just one of them. Because you, you can get a lot of different meanings from the from Hebrew letters, really. But that's a powerful one. Who is this Yahweh, the hand of grace that was nailed in grace? Hand, nails, by grace. You get it? So you're given a new name. A new identity. Right? A new identity. That's kind of what I want to talk about because... We're living in some cuckoo times right now. And you might be afraid. Is God really with me? Is God really for me? Does he have my back? Will he say yes to me? Am I accepted? Maybe you got the you know what. And you're worried. Did I fail God? Was I, did, I, did I cave in? Was I not supposed to get the you know what? Is the you know what? The mark of the beast and such. I've been contacted by people that have told me I've gotten the you know what. And now I'm really, really scared. I want to tell you something about identity. It's amazing what you can learn from Paul. Because since Paul's vision, he, he was spiritually blind. And so his spiritual blindness led to his physical blindness. But then when he, his physical sight was restored by Ananias, whose name means grace of God. So his sight's restored by grace. And then his spiritual sight is also made new. I wouldn't even say restored. I'd say it was brand new. It was born again. You understand? He had new sight. And he realized it's not been this works thing that I've been under. It is by grace that we receive salvation. And it's by that one that I've been chasing after, named Yeshua HaMashiach, the one I hate, the one I've been killing, the people that represent his name. He is salvation. He is Savior. And so Paul, to the Romans, Romans is a very large letter that he wrote. And it's powerful like all his letters are. But Romans in chapter 7, Paul actually speaks as if he's got two different personalities. Like he's two different people. It's almost like he's talking about Saul and then he's talking about Paul. <laughs> the old man and the new man. See, he mentions this old man 
that does the very thing that he wishes he wouldn't do. He says that guy practices evil. But then he talks about this new man that doesn't want that at all, doesn't want to do any of the stuff that the old man wants to do. So he's got this like tug of war, this conflict within. And he talks about that guy that commits sin in him. Who is he? He says it's the flesh because that's where sin dwells. He says nothing good dwells in that, that guy, that flesh. Because sin dwells there. But he also says to consider yourself crucified, dead to the flesh, but alive in Christ, alive in spirit. So your true life, your true identity is in spirit, not in flesh. Yes, you still carry the flesh around. But that's why he says to consider it. Consider it dead. Believe it. Trust that God sees that old self dead. That old self in you that sins, that desires to sin, whatever. God sees that as dead. So... He's saying, see the way God sees you. Consider yourself dead to the flesh, but alive in Christ. Alive in spirit. I mean, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he says, the one that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. He doesn't say you're one flesh, one soul. He says you're one spirit. So God sees you in spirit. And your spirit is not separated from Christ. Your spirit is one with Christ. It's been joined together as one. That's why I always talk about that number 11. Because in English, 11 looks like two number ones. And it is two number ones. But it's two number ones. They, exactly, they reflect each other exactly as this one is. So is this one right here, right now in this world. As he is, so are you in this world. Do you get it? First John 4, 17. And when you take the two number ones that reflect each other, you join them together, they become one number. 11 looks like two, but it's one number. Your spirit is one with the spirit of Christ. In your mind, you might think you look like two, but you're actually one. But see, what the enemy wants to do is come as a thief to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your belief about who you are so he can kill you, so he can destroy, that, can destroy that physical body that you live in. Paul spoke about a guy in the Corinthian congregation that was, that was hooking up with his father's wife. This guy took his own dad's wife. His dad obviously got remarried. Maybe his, his, the, the boy's mom died. So the dad got remarried. And he had and so this guy has a stepmom. And maybe she's younger than him. Younger than the dad's son. Who knows? But there was something that made this guy want to take her for himself. So he's taking his own dad's wife and having sexual relations with her. And Paul said, This is unheard of, even among the people that are not believers. They don't even talk about this kind of sin. And this guy's doing it. And he's in the congregation and you all know about it and nobody's doing anything about it because he's saved by grace. So, hey, let's live licentious if I want, do whatever I want. And Paul wants this guy to have a mind change, you see, because this guy's sticking with his ways, sticking with his beliefs instead of doing what's called metanoia, change mind. Or in English, repentance. But it's truly a change of mind. Because if you truly did repent, it would first start in the mind and then your habits would follow. You understand? But most people want to make their habits change first and then maybe their mind will catch up. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Maybe in religion it seems like it works that way, but it really doesn't. That's why your transformation comes by the renewing of your mind, Paul says. Romans 12. So he talks about this guy who's living totally in the flesh. Which means this guy is saying, you know what, Satan, I'm in agreement with your lifestyle. I'm going to live the way you want me to live. So now that he's taken sides with Satan, Paul says, okay, let this guy go to him. And Satan's going to kill him. Let the devil kill him. 
kill his body, but his spirit would still go be with the Lord. His spirit would still be saved. That's what Paul said. Because the true identity, identity of this man was where his new name was in the spirit. His new name. And even though he was living carnally and in the flesh, and listen, the consequences are even death, Paul says. Because that gives the devil an open door. But the guy's spirit would still be with the Lord. Which makes me understand so much more when I read about things that Paul might say, neither fornicator, nor idolater, nor adulterer, nor men who lies with men, nor drunk, nor glutton, nor thief, nor liars, etc. They will not inherit the kingdom. And you're like, oh man, but what if I've done one of those things? What if I've done one of those things? And then your typical Christian will say, well, you got to practice it over and over again. Well, how many times? What, what, what's too much to where you won't inherit the kingdom? Two times, five times, 77 times? How many times till God says, okay, you just crossed the limit? Or perhaps is the one that doesn't inherit the kingdom is that old man. The Saul. It's the Paul that inherits the kingdom. Paul is written in the book of life, but perhaps the Saul. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Just speaking metaphorically here. See, you're not going to take your old person, that old man. Sin does not go into the kingdom with you. If you were to get harpazoed or raptured up right now to meet the Lord in the sky, well, you might think you, you're, you see, Paul says you're going to change in the flash of a moment or in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed. You're going to put on a glorified, immortalized, spiritually glorified new body. Greek word is oiketerion. You'll put on oiketerion. And you might think, well, that's so that I can survive the elements because who knows how high up I'm going to go up to be with the Lord, meet him in the air or in the sky, in the clouds, right? So you might think it's so they could survive the elements and perhaps that's part of it. But I would say this, you're going up and you're not bringing sin with you. So when your body is changed instantly, that's when your spirit, your soul, and body now are joined together as one. Your body, your flesh will not have sin in it anymore. Your soul, your mind will not have sin in it anymore. Do you understand that? It'll be perfect just as your spirit is. So your spirit is housed inside of you. Just like Christ was housed inside of the body of Mary, your spirit is housed inside of the body of you. And as Christ was completely sealed in Mary, sin couldn't get in him and sin couldn't come from him. Well, the same from your spirit, man. Sin can't get into your spirit and sin can't come from within, can't come out of your spirit. It can't be produced or in Greek, poyo. It can't do something called poyo. Your spirit cannot produce or manufacture sin. That would help you understand 1 John 3, 9 so much better because it uses that Greek word poyo and it tells you about the seed of Christ that's in you and that seed that's in you is the one that's incapable of sin. Your flesh, your flesh wants to sin. But your spirit has nothing to do with sin. And that's where Paul, back in Romans chapter 7, he shows you the separation of the flesh and the spirit. The one that wants to sin and the one that has nothing to do with sin. The word of God is so sharp that it, it can, I mean, it's one thing to divide the flesh and the spirit. But how about the soul and the spirit? Because the, the word of God can pierce even that. So that you can see the difference between the two, right? The thief wants to come and rob you so that you don't know who you are. And that so that you will believe that the one that's messing up is the real you. So he can steal your hope and destroy your beliefs. So you'll cave in and give up and maybe even go along with whatever the world tells you to do today. 
But no matter what happens to you, even if you're, you were to step out of that body of yours, that spirit man of yours is not going to go into a place weeping and gnashing its teeth and burning forever and ever and ever. No, you know what does that? Is that old self, the old man. That old man goes into what you might call eternal destruction, never to be seen again. But that's not you. You go into life, Ahianios. You might call it eternal. Ahianios is an age long quality, Christ quality of life. And it's beautiful. We just got to know who we are in Him and who He is in us. We got to know our true identity, my friends. When you know your true identity, that you have been made the righteousness of God in Him, you'll start walking in it more. You'll start thinking in it more. You'll start living in it more. You might be thinking, I don't walk in the Spirit, right? I walk according to the flesh. I can't be saved. No, if you're walking according to the flesh, it's because you don't know who you are. You can't change your flesh with your flesh. It's first the spirit. You're born again in spirit. When that is changed, and then your mind starts to figure things out and st starts to go in alignment with the spirit, then you start to think differently. And when you start to think differently, then you start to do differently. Right? And even Paul. Some people, they just see him as the greatest. You know, he's the greatest ever. And, and um, however you see Paul, but even Paul had struggles in that flesh. And he openly talks about it in Romans chapter 7. And he's not encouraging wicked, evil behavior. He's just saying, yeah, I deal with this too. So you got to know the division between who you are in flesh and who you are in spirit. Because in spirit, you got a new name. And it's written on a white pebble. And that pebble, it means yes and amen. Because God has accepted you. Because you are in the beloved one. Who is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And when you truly start to know that and understand that, you don't need to fear about all this stuff that's going on today and where you might be going because you're safe, because you're in the one whose name means salvation or safety. You understand that? I hope this message has blessed you guys. I hope you all have a great one, and I'll see you all in the next video.